Hope you guys all had a great night. My name is Abdullah Snowbar. I'm the executive director for the DMZ, a tech accelerator in downtown Toronto, Canada. It's a pleasure to be here today. And we are going to be having another pitch session. Um, and thank you very much for joining us for the second round of pitches, which you'll be seeing an incredible group, an incredible group of people pitching in a couple minutes. Um, for those of you who don't know, though, Pitch is an on-stage startup battle uh, where a selection of Web Summit companies are selected to pitch their businesses uh, to a panel of esteemed judges, which I'll introduce in a second. Um, uh, and these panel of judges, come, uh, they're comprised of members from the investment community, uh, partner, media, and of course, speakers. Um, there's going to be eight startups today that are going to be presenting to you. Um, and in this group, there's gonna be, they're going to be coming from various different industries and verticals and sectors. So it's not one specific area in particular, rather a variety, which is going to be quite neat. And the most interesting pitch will become the pitch master pitch champion. So we're excited for that. And each startup, the rules, each startup has three minutes to present and then three minutes to get Q&As from the esteemed panel of judges. After that, we'll move on to, to the other, other startup. We're good? So before we move any further, I want to introduce to you our panel of judges. So starting from the, my left on this side, uh, we have Gonzalo Costa Andrade from IBM Portugal. Uh, next to him, we have Avi Mayer from Travel Park. Next to him, we have Dennis Smith from Evolution Equity Partners and a fellow Canadian. Um, and next to him, we have Misha Wetzel from Energy Ventures. So. Our judges will be scoring the startups on five different categories, and it's really important to understand this. The five categories, which I know all the startups have been briefed on already, are going to include product, potential to disrupt, financials, team, and of course, the quality of the actual pitch itself. So our first startup is going to be uh, Copernicus. Uh, so please welcome to the stage our first presenter, Tim. Oh, you have I have one. Uh -huh. Okay. The question we were asking ourselves was, will Google do to cars what they did to the phones? So basically initiate a tectonic shift in an industry, and we think they will. We, that is a team that has a strong experience in software, in the software industry, anything from like the commercial side of things to hardcore development through AI, um, came up with one mission, and that mission is to enable AI-based self-driving on European serial production automobiles today. Not tomorrow, not 2025, but actually have something that starts today. And the cars that you see are regular cars, not modified with like 10,000, 100,000, a million, thousand, a million uh, US of, um, of equipment. Um, what do we do? So first of all, it is important to understand that Traditional um, ADA system, advanced driver assist systems, were implemented on individual cars. That itself is a concept of the past. Something like, an, like a middleware or call it an Android for cars is needed where software is implemented from people that know software to a middleware to an, to an API that they understand. And on the other hand, that, this, that there needs to be a middleware that actually speaks the car tag because right now there is no bridge between these two worlds. Um, there are right now already more than 150 companies developing self-driving software, and that is good. And we're not competing with them, but we actually want to enable them to be operational on cars as soon as possible. That allows car manufacturers to actually increase their efficiency today. I'm going to show you how. It obviously opens up the cars for development, and ultimately it should be the basis to run um, an update and upgrade throughout the life cycle of the car, the self-driving car technology on the car. How do we do the OEM efficiency increase right now? Right now, let's take Wolfs Volkswagen's Wolfsburg plant. There are 4,000 drivers that have to get into the car and drive the cars into the log logistics stream. That is something that we, we can automate with a specific solution. How we do that? Um, we just basically take just the middleware in the, in the car and we put on top of that, cameras on the wall, and we take the entire hardware stack that is needed in the car, we actually put it um, on the wall. We remote control, basically, the cars. Um, that can evolve into self-parking, and that can evolve into full self-driving in the future. The competitive landscape is still fairly nascent in, for what we do. So we compete with self-parking solutions. Uh, there are a few and in the middleware space. Um, the roadmap is we are currently deploying the first pilot with a um, OEM. More pilots to come, the first plant next year. 
And uh, we are obviously, like all startups here, we're raising funding. We are a team of 10 based in uh, Berlin. We have uh, a team of uh, developers, uh, two years old, and happy to take any more questions and visit us in booth B335 today. Yep. But it starts counting up then. <laughs> So um, dealing with car manufacturers, OEMs, can be a frustrating experience, as you probably know. So how long do you, will it take until you are really in production and, and live on, on actual compounds? So we came out of stealth with the product that we have in June, and we're now deploying with the first German OEM. So it actually, it's a proof of concept. That was cool. So how long it'll take us into production, uh, we'll see about that. But there is a strong demand for this kind of a uh, production automation. And for us, it looks that this could be the path into a real uh, OS system to be in the car over the entire lifetime. But yes, it is a long sales cycle. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, can you tell me where, where does the software that you're developing, where does it reside in a current production model? So what we, we are, the, the car that we're using right now is a car that has the actuators for steering and gas and brakes. So the only thing we put on the car is a, a low power consumption middleware software. And all the heavy lifting is done outside of the car because the cars are not ready yet for self-driving. They don't have the compute power. They don't have all the sensors. So we're basically putting cameras on the wall. We have a big server rack with NVIDIA GPUs. And, and the, the, the one thing that we do is, the only thing we do on the car is basically telling him where to go. So we basically convert the car into a radio-controlled car as we had as kids. But do you provide a piece of hardware, that will, firmware that operates the, the, soft, the receiving software and the, and the control? Two, there are two options. So e either at production, the software is implemented in the car stack. Or there is a, we call it a backpack solution, which is basically a dongle um, that contains everything that is at the end of production plugged in, okay. and then logistics plugged out again. So thanks for speaking for Rich. Uh, the OEM solution seems, if I understand correctly, to be a, a middle step towards uh, a bigger goal. So what's, what's the end game? What, what's, well, what the, the end game for us is to be the operating system that not only does the production, but actually manages all different AIs that, it, that are going to run onto the car. So everything from what we do right now towards a level three solution, hopefully a level four and a level five solution. So increased autonomy, everything from managing the updates, upgrades, and all business models that you can think about, including the payments involved. And how is your business model? So you sell those, uh, that middleware, and uh, what, how do you monetize it? Do you have uh, some kind of uh, ongoing, uh, it's, for the initial step, it's, it's software licensing. It's basically active um, middlewares deployed to cars. Uh, and it's, it's the hardware installation um, and, and concurrent parallel driver. So basically, it's, it's software licensing right now with, with update fees over a few years. The end game is that we have the middleware and every, every commercial transaction that's done there Let's think of uh, upgrading and, and every purchase that is done through the middleware that we get a cut of, cut of that, similar to an iTunes uh, business model. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, next up, we have Fidier from, uh, and Francois is going to be coming up to present. So, Francois, over to you. You have three minutes. Nope. Good morning. Uh, so let's start with a little game. It's called Guess Who Am I? So I waste your precious time. I annoy your customers and you see me every single day. Uh, guess who am I? Well, surveys. Well, goodbye surveys. I'm pretty sure you've got thousands of surveys in your own inbox. Maybe it's time to say goodbye and maybe it's time to get value for the time you spend. Well, that's what Feature is about. So, my bad. Nope. So my name is Francois Forest. I'm CEO, but it's a small company, so doing most of my time development of Feature. And Feature is a feedback platform that aims to make feedback a great experience and something you want to do again and again. So how do we do it? Well, we create feedback, which are the best parts. So we create a good experience, and we are going to ask you two highly targeted questions rather than 10 questions. We are going to play and gamification. 
Uh, so we are going to offer you a reward in exchange for your time. And last but not least, we are going to start a relationship with you. Um, so how do we do it? Well, it's an easy three-step process. Uh, so we're going to ask ratings, we're going to ask uh, highly targeted questions, engagements, rewards, and then we are going to let you do that uh, through a powerful dashboard uh, that lets you design your own campaign, that lets you design uh, your own reward program and your own engagements. Uh, that's what Feature is about. And um, we go one step further. We help you target the right users. So through SMS, email campaign, uh, your own website widget, and so on. So uh, sounds good? How does that look? Uh, so Feature lets you know how happy are your customers in real time. That means we can push specific engagement to specific people and at the right moment. So as you can see here, you're having uh, you're done with the feedback, you're having a good experience, you just won a $5 uh, reward, which means loyalty, by the way, uh, and then we are going to push you a five-star ratings, uh, because we know you are happy, and we know your feedback, and we know you, and we can ask the right action from you. Um, so about the business, uh, well, the ugly and the bad. It's overcrowded, there are a lot of people, and... Um, it's a slow-moving market. It's been about asking question, asking question, asking more question with more question types, no innovation. And what Feature is, is uh, an ID that binds the gamification markets and the surveys markets um, to make something that people actually want to do and where you will not lose your time. Um, so how do we make money? We run subscriptions. Um, so we have three simple plans uh, and we make money with custom pricing plans as well. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and um, have a great day. So we didn't, it was too fast. What is your team, or what is the... OK, yeah, sorry. So uh, it's a team of, uh, it's a remote team. Uh, we are six, OK? So we're based in Lille, north of France. Um, and we are uh, working in the US and in Bangladesh as well. Thank you. Can you talk about traction, so existing customer base and, and revenue? Yeah, and sure. Uh, so we have uh, we started in March 2018. Okay, uh, we got as of right now uh, 3,500 users. Okay, and collecting more than 25,000 feedback. Um, and we've been doing that through campaigns, so product and AppSumo campaigns uh, to get the first like you know batch of users. Uh, and right now we're trying to onboard specific companies to understand their needs. Uh, and to uh, build the perfect reward program and to build the perfect feedback experience. What, what's your go-to-market strategy? How do you get the next uh, you know, 10,000 uh, go-to-market strategy? How do you get the next 10,000 accounts? Uh, well, we narrow down to uh, companies. We are looking for companies with uh, very high challenges when it comes to surveys and when it comes to understanding users. And we say, OK, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, how do we do it? So we're trying to get specific use cases and to build more use cases to onboard more users. And we're going, we reach, we're actually reaching companies uh, one by one saying, uh, no one answer your surveys, uh, try with us. And maybe if you give your, if you give your users uh, a good experience, if you offer them a reward, and if you value their time, uh, you will get high expectations on top of it, and uh, it, will be, it will be a win-win situation, basically. Um, I'm company ABC. I'm interested in surveys and engagement with customers. 15 seconds or less. Um, what, where do I get a better return and ROI from your product versus the other products that are available. Okay, so what Feature does is that it calculates automatically in real time uh, through machine learning and through a very well-defined process uh, whether you're happy or not, okay? And depending on this, uh, depending on the other users, we're able to push highly targeted engagements and we're going to adapt the question. So as I said, we're going to, uh, if you use another survey platform, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time with a lot of questions which are going to be all the same. And what we're doing is providing a unique uh, experience by learning about the user and providing reports that will focus on the users rather than the questions. Are you able to give me two use cases of people who have used it and what the results yeah. were? I mean, sure. We're not going to get into that, but 
So uh, yeah. basically, we're selling, we have another company, that's why it's bootstrapped, uh, where we're selling website templates. And we are the perfect example because we build that platform exactly for this. Uh, so whenever you're getting, for example, too many uh, customers and it's very tough to understand them, they just go, like a supermarket, for example, they just go, you never learn from them. And that's it. Thank you, Francois. So next up, we have a really interesting business that kind of brings real estate with an intersection of technology. So I'm going to ask Michael to come up from Retium uh, and uh, give his start his pitch for three minutes. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Mall. I'm the CPO and co-founder of Retium. Retium is a global real estate investment platform and security token exchange. So let's look at the market. Real estate is the largest asset class in the world at $280 trillion, but it's actually the most illiquid. Every year, only $1.5 trillion trades, and that's less than half a percent. That's because everybody wants to own, but not everyone can afford. So let's look at the problem. Real estate investing is hard. The large capital requirements required excludes the majority of the world's population. Real estate asset owners find it difficult to find investors, and, and investors find it difficult to find vetted properties that they can trust. Crowd investing is a good start, but it's actually very liquid. Everyone has to exit at the same time. Here's our solution. Our solution is a global crowdfunding platform that can allow anybody to invest in real estate for as little as $100 wherever they are in the world, and it's very easy, and here's how it works. Oh. Oh. Uh, not sure why my slide's not going forward. Um, wow. Um, so I'm just going to continue. So here's how it works. There we go. So here's how it works. Step one, you verify your identity by scanning your ID. Step two, you load a wallet from any cryptocurrency or using a bank wire or using uh, any, any type of credit card. Number three, you browse our global market of vetted properties and invest in one click. The next step, you watch your properties appreciate as you get monthly dividend. When you want to exit, you can exit at any time. Our competitive advantage, one $100 entry fee means that you can invest um, and opens this up to a billion people who never had the chance before. Two, 24-7 liquidity. Three, we're with IBM blockchain. Four, we have vetted properties. It's a global marketplace and we're 100% compliant with securities regulation. Our revenue model, we make 1.5% buy and sell on every transaction. Social impact. We believe we're changing the face of who gets to be a real estate investor by unlocking the trillion dollars that's between millennials, people in the developing world, and seniors, and we can't be more proud of this mission. To date, we have $830 million worth of assets that are going to list on our platform starting the first quarter of 2019, and this is going to give us a projected revenue of $24 million for the year. Our team has deep, our team has deep industry experience. Our CEO has sold over uh, $500 billion of real estate and worked for 14 years. Our enterprise real estate advisor works for Blackstone. It's a $400 billion uh, fund, and he personally rewrote uh, the global REIT strategy there. Our CTO was on the founding team of Ethereum and worked for the Accenture Group. Our vision is real estate for everyone. We believe in a world where anyone with the internet connection can invest in real estate and grow their wealth. We're raising a $3 million seed round, and we'd love to talk to people. Thank you. I'm curious to uh, understand in a bit more depth how this works from a regulatory perspective and also where do you source the extra properties, who holds them, how do you tokenize them? Can you Perfect. Perfect. So uh, how it works from a regulatory uh, framework is uh, in the primary market, uh, we actually use private placement exemptions for the non-accredited investors. So we're starting with properties mainly in the United States and Canada. The United States and Canada has great retail investor rules. So in Canada, each province has retail investors can invest up to a certain portion of their income or a certain finite amount. So like between $1,000 and $10,000 per year per property. So we use those rules. Uh, who holds the properties? We use a trust company to hold the title in trust. We use broker-dealer license in the United States to do secondary trading. We're applying for a trading license in Malta to be able to do the secondary trading by ourselves. KYC. KYC. Documentation. Uh, confirmation. Review. Uh, controlling the documents from, for every $100 investor, for example. How yeah. do you do that? 
So how we do that? So we're actually very proud. We work with three KYC providers around the world. Uh, one KYC provider actually covers a thousand databases, so we resell from them, so we can scan a, an ID from there. Uh, in terms of anti-money laundering, we then work with another group that does anti-money laundering for Ethereum wallets, then anti-money laundering for Bitcoin wallets. In terms of everybody's documentation, the ability to then take that ID, to take their money, and then if they do a bank wire, our third-party vendors handle all that, and then they charge us a fee. So we're uh, a marketplace of compliance vendors who work on our behalf, on the behalf of the asset owners. So you're raising three million now. Uh, how much did you raise before? Uh... Yeah, so we raised 630,000 through a friends and family run, mainly in Canada. And uh, that's brought us till today. Uh, we have 2,000 registered users ready, ready to invest. Our first property deal will be a single bedroom condo in Vancouver, and that will be on in the next month. We'll do 10 single condo deals just to make sure that we have everything under our belt, and then we're gonna unload the rest of the major properties uh, in the new year. And what you need from us? Uh, we're looking for strategic investors uh, who have uh, deep understanding of regulatory frameworks, uh, who have access to deal flow as well, and then the third thing, who understand how to ma market to the mass market. So we're looking for those three things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Michael. So in the interest of time, let's get uh, Nirsov Pedro up here. Uh, to, to start his, uh, his three-minute pitch. Pedro, over to you. So you use it, you use it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are Nearsoft, and we are presenting our product, uh, Near Banking, that is a mobile banking for the visual impaired. So... Uh, what are the problem we're trying to solve? 4% of the population have this type of problems. And in the financial industry, uh, electronic bank banking solutions are not secure to use, are not prepared for multi-language, and the people doesn't have uh, uh, enough autonomy to do their financial transactions. So what is the solution? The solution is near banking for this financial inclusion. So the product is born. What you need to do this? You need a kit. You need your smartphone with our banking application, mobile banking application installed that only communicates with the user by sound. You need a card reader with a Bluetooth that is connected to the, to the mobile phone and a special card that has a fingerprint reader and a headphone so uh, your communications can be safe. So how the magic happens here? Uh, we have all has 10 fingers on our hands. So we can create commands with, our, with a sequence of fingers. For example, this finger after this finger can be give me my balance. This finger after this finger can give me my two last movements. And so the banks can create uh, uh, transactions that these kind of people can do uh, for themselves. How we see our competition? Uh, things like voice assistants Alexa and Siri, they work well in English and on other one or two language, but they, they are not language agnostic as Nearsoft. And we also secure it because this card cannot be cloned and uh, we are using strong uh, uh, cryptography and uh, um, on the scans. Call centers are not also a good uh, solution. What makes it perfect? No credentials needed, no language barriers. Uh, you are autonomous to use and you can create unlimited combinations of commands. So what is our business module? We license the app, we do the, the customization, we sell the kit to the bank so they can give to the clients, and, and we charge an annual fee of 120 euros for the use of the card and the maintenance. So we believe uh, if we have 
around 20, 25 banks, we can achieve some interesting values in terms of maintenance and licensing and customization. Uh, we are seeking for uh, 200,000 euros for 10%. So we can scale in terms of development, research and development, and marketing. We are a team of 13 fintech addicted people, and we are growing. And thank you. So, Pedro, in terms of solution, this goes as an interface for any bank application. Yes. Uh, so we already work on the fintech uh, area as channel solutions developers, things like internet banking, mobile, and we look at this. Ha you can look at this as a plugin for that, or uh, as an individual uh, application that the bank can have a second app prepared for this part of their clients. And how, we, how do you plan? to train the individuals in terms of okay. what they will... Uh... So, yeah, that's a, a good part. We can demo, uh, understand, but the bank has to do the onboarding, okay? So when the, when the, the person goes to the bank, the, the bank does the onboarding and the people define for each command which sequences they want to do, okay? Why, why do you need the hardware? Why don't you do it all software, just on the phone? Sorry? Why do you need the hardware? Why don't you do it just a software solution on, on the phone? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. Uh, we develop a mobile application for the last 10 years. And uh, the only thing that the fingerprints on our mobile phones does and uh, the voice uh, and on the face recognition says true or false, they are easily hackable. So this acts like a computer. Uh, this card is completely dead. If you put here, it has energy, but it's still dead. So we need a, a correct finger to boot like a computer in a few seconds. So this way, nobody can clone this. Nobody can hack this. It's, uh, if, you, if you want to format this card, you cannot without the finger of the person that onboard that. Also, a good thing, uh, the banks and the, the other type of industry can customize the image on the cards. Uh, we also on roadmap, we have four gigs of memory preparing f here f to store all kinds of things, uh, to introduce new types of technologies, store documents, etc. The sequencing of the commands are individual to a particular bank. Are they the same for every customer of the bank? No, or no, is no. it uni unique for each customer? They are unique for each customer. As the customer goes, goes to the bank, and the bank has, OK, we have this Virgin uh, card. So which sequence do you want for checking the balance? And, and the client does the onboarding, and it's safe. So each client has uh, uh, a sequence. And do they listen on a telephone to do the yeah. and confirm so the sequence? So on the kit, uh, on the slide on the kit, you need the, the mobile phone, yeah. the card, the carrier. And if you want, the headphones. So even you don't have to talk like you have to talk with Alexa and things like that. So this is another kind of security that, that call centers cannot have. And, uh, and uh, Alexas and Siri's, um, you know. You're going to sell to a bank in Bulgaria. Yeah. So how do I get? I'm the bank, how do I activate Bulgarian for all the activities through the okay. system? So uh, we integrate, um, we, we are a fintech company, and we integrate with lots of core systems and middlewares. So the, response, the responses that came from the, the banking main system are transformed in voice, okay? So there are voice to uh, text to voice translations for almost all language. And you're doing this? No, Are you we providing we, that? Or? Yeah, we provide with the product. Okay. okay fine. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. So, folks, that's four down, four to go. Judges were good. The audience were good. All right. Next up, we have uh, Stefan from Airnest.
Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan from Ernest. And um, in exactly one month, we'll begin Christmas time, you know. And uh, people and children are often told that uh, Santa Claus is going to offer gifts all around the world. But you know, this is still another lie, because more than half of the humanity have no postal address to be delivered by Santa Claus. And this problem of addresses is far more serious when you speak about uh, social economic inclusion, security, and at the end, according to the United Nations, when um, uh, four billion people are away from citizenship. And that concerns um, uh, people, but also businesses in 150 countries and more than 10,000 medium side, but only in Africa. Obviously, traditional addressing programs uh, already exist, but their costs and time are prohibitive. And when we discovered that in Kenya with Pedro here, my Portuguese associate, uh, we decided to build the future of addressing. And we created Ernest. Ernest is the only low-cost addressing solution compliant with international postal standards. It provides an address for everyone, everywhere. It works as well for huge cities or informal settlements. And uh, its, implement its implementation is very, uh, very uh, uh, quick. The solution is composed by an assisted street and building addressing solution using artificial intelligence uh, applied to satellite imageries and uh, taking care of the geographical constraints of a wall tone. The result is a repository of geolocalized addresses. Uh, and once this repository has been created, everybody can ask for its own address through a mobile app, which can locate you and send you your standardized address, postal address. At the end, we provide a set of web tools which allow cities to manage their um, street name, uh, their uh, signage map, and addresses. So, Ernest has been introduced recently in Tanzania to the Pan-African Postal Union and has been uh, uh, largely approved. We sell to government, cities, and private companies. And the solution is free for people. To industrialize uh, our working prototype and to market it abroad, we need a first contribution of uh, 600,000 euros. So, as a conclusion, uh, it's uh, Christmas time soon. So, be impactive and offer citizenship. Thank you very much. Obrigado. You've mentioned that you sell to cities and governments. That is yeah. obvious. But also, you mentioned private companies. What's the use for a private company? Yeah, uh, we uh, plan to sell to uh, especially uh, LMD, uh, e-commerce companies. So we, we try to make some uh, um, uh, uh, partnership with uh, e-commerce companies, essentially. So we contact uh, lots of companies and we, trade, we try to, to make business with them. It's in course. Do you, do you hold any patents for the... Uh for the uh, generation of, of address? Have you applied for patents? Sorry? I, Patent I protection. <laughs> I didn't understand the question, sorry. The core is the generation of, code, of address codes. Yes. Have you patent, applied for patents for that process? Yes, yes. We, you have? We haven't used this, this uh, pattern in, in, uh, in different countries, in different situations. And in actually, it, it works very, very fast. Of course, it is a solution is why we don't call it an application, because you need also to, to make, a, make a, a quality check control after the, the right. solution runs. But have you actually 
filed for patents in the United States and... We are working with the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, United States, and the UPU is Union post uh, Nations in Bern to, to apply the standards of uh, addressing system in this. And they, uh, they um, agree that this respect... The, but you haven't filed for patents yet? No, not okay. yet. Okay, you should be. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure... Can, can you describe one use case um, of, of this? Basically, normal, uh, the address is a, a, co a city authority, okay? And today, it, it, everything is done by hand. Anything, everything is done in a, in, a, in a GIS program, if you know uh, what is a GIS program, hand by hand, and it takes six months to do this work. Uh, with Ernest, in one hour, you can address a, a city of one million. I, we did it recently in Paris uh, to Benin, to Cotonou, is the capital, uh, economic capital of Benin, and in, in 10 minutes, we get one million of, uh, of city uh, on, uh, inhabitants address it just like that. And we have 10% of error in the, in the, in the application. So it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Next up, we have Arthur from Find and Order. And we have a lot of French companies today, which uh, I got to give a big shout out to the French for hosting that incredible investment uh, dinner yesterday, the investor dinner that we had. Left a lot of people coming in pretty late today, which is, uh, which is all good. Over to you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Arthur, co-founder at Find and Order. We have started based in Paris, uh, France. Uh, we are an indoor positioning and uh, guiding system. We already address a few sectors like uh, retail, uh, supply chain operators, hospitals, and um, sorry, hospitals, and also transport company, like you see now, and a supply chain operator. Uh, any large retail area that needs like a 3D modeling. 3D mapping and a geo-positioning system on it. Sorry, I'm really bad. So basically, the product is uh, two things. That the 3D modeling we're gonna, uh, gonna set from your 2D plan. We're gonna generate a 3D maps, very accurate, very user-friendly, a SimCity-like product uh, from which you will be able like, to plug many functionalities on it. One of these functionality you can embed is a geo-positioning system. This one is pretty specific because we have 25 centimeter accuracy with no infrastructure. It's based on magnetic field capture. And with that tool, we can set a lot of B2C or B2B applications. I'm going to give you an example on two sectors. The first one is retail. That's our uh, DNA. So we're selling already the solution to a few retailers in France. And the solution is for customers to help them find their product easily for team installs to optimize picking process, for instance, and also for providers, for providers to optimize their merchandising process and also for them to assess uh, like marketing in stores. Another use case interesting is supply chain. Supply chain, we're dealing with FM logistics, for instance, and they know when a pallet get in and out, but they don't know what happened into the warehouse. So with this system, we can set a map for operators, 3D or 2D, it depends. And also, above all, we're going to be able to geolocate pallets into the warehouse. So we can optimize like traffic into the warehouse, prioritization of pallets, and make all the process faster for these guys. So, so far, we have a team of seven people. One is missing. It's a Unity developer. Uh, we are two co-founders. We cover both of us uh, technical development, business development, and finance. And we have uh, four amazing tech guys. One designer working on the map, and three R&D engineers with a focus on back-end, a focus on 3D modeling, and a focus on uh, mobile development. And we are recruiting 10 more engineers next year with the, the phone ranging with uh, closing now. So at this stage, we have made 150K this year, and we plan to do 1 million. Uh, we're going to deploy the first clients we have in France uh, over the network in Europe. Thank you for your time.
how long does it take for you to map something? I, I know that it will depend on the complexity, but uh, usually... So the robot is going at uh, 3,500 square meters per hour. If we want to really have like a really sharp scan, we will need like a three scans. So let's say 100, 200 per hour. Uh, 1,000, sorry, 200 square meters per hour. So for Laura Merlin in France, in a 12,000 square meters store, we need it only one night. And the scan is set for the rest of the year. It's only they change uh, walls or very structural things in store. They need to call back for the robot to scan. What, what's the business model? Is it uh, charged by scan, by map? So we have a set of fee for every unit every shopping center store or uh, warehouse. And uh, like for instance, for retailers, it's gonna be around 10,000K per store. It's a one-off payment. And it's a license fee uh, they use. Uh, it's um, euros per square meter per year. So it's gonna be between one euro per square meter per year to four euros, uh, depending on the, the target and what they need. So I'm walking around in the store in a store or a shopping center. So I need my telephone. What equipment do you use to ensure that the signal in, within the environment is strong enough that you get the data that you need and I need? So basically, we only need 3G, uh, and uh, we embed our system into our client's application. It's not our application. People don't need to know find an order. So with uh, our SDK, we make it a small like, modification on Laura Merlin application. Uh, you're a user, you go to the store. We're going to know you arrive in the store because we activate like, your, um, your sensors in your phone. And with your sensors, like every phone has them, it's pretty basic ones, we're going to be able to say very precisely, accurately where you are with 25, 20 centimeters. Same thing for products, if you need to find them. We use their inventory process to know where the products are. Every time they scan a product, they use like PDA smartphones. They scan the product and we allocate a position to the product. So the cells, the mobile cell in this place is saturated. Many shopping malls are heavily saturated. I, my question is, do you need to propagate or repeat the signals in order to get efficient use of your platform? or are you just depending on whatever is available within the, uh, within the closed building? Well, it's real-time guidance. So yeah, we, there's a communication between our SDK and uh, the system. Uh, it's, uh, we are using only web services. It's pretty light. So you're depending upon the quality of the signal in, the, in this room, for example. Yeah, but we need only 3G. With 3G, it works. We just need the application to work, but we don't need like a GPS uh, on, for instance. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. So the next startup is really interesting because I had a personal encounter when I came from Toronto to Portugal. Our flight was delayed 12 hours. So the next one is actually going to be you know, close to home because I'll be calling you up as soon as I get back to Toronto. But uh, we have Igor coming up from my flight right. Hi, guys. <laughs> so yes, my name is Igor. I'm the co-founder of the company My Fly Right. And before I kick off with a slide deck, I would have like two quick questions for you. So the first one, how many of you did have a flight delay or flight cancellation within the last three years? Come on, come on, come on. There are probably more than that. So pretty much everyone, yeah? So the next question I have for you, how many of you have actually received a compensation from the airline because of your incident? Yeah, a couple of them I see here and there. But that's exactly the problem. Um, too many people actually not getting their compensations because of the certain incidents that we are fighting for. And uh, the question is pretty much like why? Yeah? So I'll tell you why. First of all, you might be not completely aware of your rights. Yeah? So that's the first thing. The second one, you're approaching the airlines, but the airlines are actually quite reluctant to pay out uh, that compensation. And then you just give up because you don't want to go through the legal process. And the third one is because you're just too lazy. You don't have the time to figure out how it actually works. So this is where we come into the game. So what's our value proposition for the customer? So we are basically a bunch of legal experts 
protecting your rights. So we know everything about that and we're going to take care of that. The second basically most important factor of our business, you don't have any cost risk. So you come to us, we process your claim completely for free and if we, and only if we win the case, we actually going to take a commission. And the third one, it's super easy and it's super fast. Coming to our platform is going to take you around three to five minutes and it's done. So you wait and see your money coming in. And our vision for the future is actually to become the ultimate one-stop solution for all aviation rights for all passengers across the world. Yeah? So this is like we want to be. So our path so far, like how does it actually look like? So we found in 2016, we launched our product last year in March and we closed our seed funding round uh, this summer. So now we are growing and that's a great journey. Oh, sorry. Um, so what are passenger rights are we covering? We are talking now here at the moment about flight delays, flight cancellation, uh, the night boarding. We're going to introduce in 2019 luggage problems. Yeah, everyone has probably missed his luggage at some point. And the ticket refunds. You miss your flight, you can get some money out of that. The market is big. Yeah? 33 billion we're talking about. But this is a bit complex yeah? because the different regulations are applicable in different markets. Yeah, you probably might not be so aware of what's happening where, but we are. Come to us, we'll help you. Um, what is our business model? Uh, we have two products that we're offering. The first one is the claim enforcement. So you come to us, we process your case, it's going to take some time until we get the money. And when we receive the money, we pay it out and we get a 25% uh, commission share of that. The other product is actually even more exciting and this is like the so-called data-driven artificial intelligence product. So you come to us and we know already by heart that there's a high probability that you actually are entitled for compensation. So we pay you out directly and take all the complete risk and ask. You don't have to worry about anything and we deal with the companies. So how does it look like so far for us? Um, so this is actually quite nice. Uh, we grew and uh, we're going to hit our budget targets. So we're going to process over 10 million um, euros in passenger claims that we have processed. And by 2021, we're going to grow like to around like 75 million. Whereas actually I see this is a rather conservative. We have a great team um, like with us working, um, representing software engineers, uh, uh, legal experts, operational experts, ex-consultants, basically being in uh, yeah, very reputable businesses in the past. And uh, so who are we looking for? Well, first of all, we want to educate the people. So we're looking for customers. If you had a flight delay or cancellation, please come to our website. We're looking for business partners. I heard booking.com is here. So if you're here, yeah, let me know that you're here. We should talk. Uh, we're looking for investors who actually can bring something more to the table than just money. If you have like, a certain expertise that will help us, We'll be very glad to get down with you together. And we're looking for technological innovations helping us to improve our business. So that's pretty much it is. Thanks so much. We love mail. Get in touch with us. So I think you've got some strong competition out there in the market. Uh, companies doing pretty much the same thing. What's your USP? Really? Uh, the first USP is that like, we are having the most complete service offering. So most of them either offer like one or the other products. So we're going to have like the full suit of that. And also what's happening, our competitors are offering like either like, one of these models. So either claim enforcement or actually like factory. So we're also offering that. The second biggest factor, I think, at least like what I've seen, we are really having the financial strength on pushing that through, like through the cases. The, the, um, the biggest challenge that we're having as to bring the cases to the courts. Each case that we're bringing to the court, we're talking about around like 400 euros of uh, prepayments that we're having. I don't think like too many competitors actually having that strength. And the third and foremost, I think like most important aspect is how much technology can you actually bring in processing these cases. So this is the whole back end infrastructure of that. And from what I've seen so far, I think we can also uh, compete on that, actually uh, outplay our competitors on that. Are you? All right. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much, Igor. So sir, last but certainly not least, we have Ariane, from, uh, Ariane and Luke's going to be presenting for three minutes. So Luke, over to you. Thank you. 
Hi, so we started Ariani uh, a year and a half ago with one observation, uh, which was that IoT is giving new capabilities to connected objects, um, where the data recording and data sharing. Uh, but unfortunately, some of, my, of our most valuable objects will not be co are not connected. It will probably ne not be connected for a really long time. So uh, the goal of Ariani is really to uh, use blockchain to get a, give a digital identity for all valuable objects in the world. When we talk about valuables, we talk about luxury watches, luxury bags, but also art, uh, fine art, musical instruments, uh, wines and uh, liquors, and cars. Uh, so we use blockchain, but um, for uh, the user like you, it's really just an app. Uh, it's an app with all your valuables. Each one of your products has uh, a, a digital identity, kind of like a passport for your product. Uh, each, uh, pro each passport allows you to uh, figure out the, whether the product is authentic because this passport is actually uh, created by the brand who, who made the, the product. It allows you to get the history of the product, whether it was actually serviced on time, for instance. Uh, and it allows you also to uh, see if it was stolen or not. Uh, and you can then transfer it if you resell the product. Uh, so it's really a cool app for owners. Uh, but for brands, it's an entire other thing. Uh, all this really builds a universal product registry uh, of all valuable products and their owners. Pseudonymous owners, uh, but still the current owner of a product. Uh, what does that mean? When you actually um, cross this information with an identification system and a personal information system and a messaging system, you actually get an augmented CRM. Not only do you know who you're reaching, you actually know that you're reaching the current owner of a product. But that vision is really kind of Web 2.0. Uh, if you actually merge this with uh, systems who are uh, decentralized, uh, you actually get a decentralized CRM. Why is that interesting? Well, first, it gives back the, the ownership of, product, of um, uh, data to the current owner. And for the brand on the other side, it greatly uh, simplifies uh, GDPR compliance. Uh, of course, when you have this uh, universal product registry, you can use it um, to build an ecosystem of service providers. Um, we can have marketplaces like Goat, Mecenas, uh, insurance companies really interested in the, the idea of a one-click uh, insurance, and a bunch of other applications. Uh, so our first uh, go-to-market is the luxury industry uh, for three reasons, because customers are used to having those certificates, uh, there's minimal regulation, and it's a big market, dominated by five, uh, by five big companies in France and Switzerland when we're based. And the good thing is that we're actually already working with three of them. Uh, on the team side, uh, we have uh, a bunch of uh, repeat entrepreneurs uh, who have raised over $200 million in, in uh, funds uh, over their career and uh, sold for a multiple of this. Uh, we have deep luxury industry expertise, and we've been in the crypto space for uh, several years. Uh, we also just closed last week a $4 million token pre-sale, so we have some, uh, some runway. Thank you very much. So you've mentioned that you're already working with a few of the luxury groups, LVM, Ush, et cetera. So what does that mean exactly? How are you working with those groups? So we really work with groups. So on our blockchain, the, so it's a, it's a public with permission blockchain, meaning that the only people that can actually create uh, those uh, digital um, uh, passports are the brands. Uh, they pay a fee uh, to the, the actual protocol that sustains the protocol to, uh, to create this, uh, this uh, passport. Uh, and uh, then they pay also a fee to send messaging to uh, the different wallets of, uh, of product owners. And they already do that? They are paying right now? Or, oh, or yeah. No, so no, no. so right now, uh, we're launching in April. Uh, they, we're, we're only testing with them at the moment. And in April, they'll be paying in, uh, in the token, the AYA token. Got it. OK. Yeah. So I assume a lot of the owners of luxury items prefer to be anonymous. Uh, how do you support that? So we don't actually record any identity on our registry. Um, you just need to have your wallet and a public-private key. We have a, you can actually use a, a login with the app, which will store, uh, which will do custody of the of the public and private key, or the private key mainly. Um, but so, we so, just so do I not go, record information. So I go to the Louis Vuitton store, and you ask me for public and private uh, encryption key. No, actually, you, you generate the private key on the app. Okay. You'll just enter your an email address, we can be whatever email address, and a password, and then it will automatically generate the, the private key, and the app will, will do the, the, the entire uh, management of the private key. Will, will the brand make it mandatory, or will it be uh, uh, optional? By no, it will be optional. The idea is that the app allows you to not have to deal with, your, with custody of your private keys, uh, but at the same time, you still have the possibility to not even use the app, just have your, your private key stored completely uh, um, privately on a cold storage, if you, if you like. 
you're only planning planning to have uh, tokens, no cash payments. So, th so there's there's two sides of, of what we're doing here. There's the protocol side that has to be decentralized and that has to be self-sustaining. That's what we're building right now with the registry um, because it really needs to be a, a separate entity. Uh, all this is token-based. Uh, then on the other side, when you look at the the CRM, the augmented CRM and the decentralized CRM, yeah, this is a different company. So one is a foundation, the other one is a company that really helps and creates those interfaces for um, brands to, um, to actually be able to use that uh, decentralized CRM. No good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. And that's a wrap for the presentation. So I want to say a big thank you to all the startups that presented. So one last round of applause. Thank you. So we just need a minute to calculate and tabulate all the, uh, all the, uh, the scores. So we want to make sure we give enough time for the folks to do that. In the meantime, I want to ask the judges, what do you guys think? So the level of companies that you guys saw today, there's eight that came in before this, eight coming in after this. Overall, what do you think? Whoever has a mic. Well, a lot of uh, diversity, so uh, good ideas, uh, interesting speech. And it's really neat to see, I think, the level and maturity of the companies that are coming to the stage now compared to probably a few years ago. It's actually, it's quite remarkable. So I think it's exciting. I'm actually, I'm actually used to being here, less here. You used to be here? I, I'm in pitching. In oh, okay. Place. And I think the quality is super high, super yeah. high quality. It yeah. is, it is very high. Well, yeah. And the beauty is we're seeing an international group of, few, of individuals coming to pitch as well, which is really keeping, keeping it a lot more uh, diverse and, and inclusive, which is really neat. So anything in particular that stood out for you today? that you want to speak to without, without, without leaking the results? Anything, any kind of technology, deep tech, or any kind of particular area that really kind of resonated? Uh, it's, it's interesting to see how blo blockchain is progressing in the, a lot of startups, besides the AI, but the blockchain is gaining traction, yeah. Blockchain is a big yeah, one, Dennis? I, I, would, I would agree that it's nice to see blockchain actually being applied in, a, in real cases. There was a number of cases that wasn't forcing the technology, but you could see why the technology will be as, assist what they're doing. Absolutely, no, I agree, I agree with that. And I think, I think a big part of it as well, is a lot of things just need time to kind of mature. And I think we're seeing that in many different ways. So, and Misha, what about you? What do you think is, what, how'd you find today's, uh, today's session? Uh, awesome, really. <laughs> uh, the overall quality was very good. Uh, it was very diff difficult for me to really pick a winner here. I, I mean, there were uh, at it's least hard. three or four teams who could, who could be the number one spot right now. It, it is very hard, absolutely. And I, I hope for all some, maybe if there's some investors in the crowd, I hope you're going to be looking at continuing the conversation with the startups afterwards. If there's uh, some people that want to continue making introductions and helping these guys, please do so. I think we can all imagine these folks put their hearts and lives into these businesses. So in any way we can help them, we want to do that. So I'm going to ask all the startups to come up on stage. Give you some time to line up here. It's a, <laughs> somehow I always end up being the shortest person on stage, and that's okay. So maybe we get a bit of a drum roll. Anybody? No? Okay. Anyway, so the, the winner for today is Ritiam. Michael. So congratulations, Michael, and to the team. I want to say a big thank you to all of you, the startups that presented. A big thank you to the judges and to the panel. And a big thank you to all of you as well. Obviously, these things are not easy, so we appreciate the dedication, the time, and the perseverance that you put into your operations. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a five-minute break, and then we're going to have another eight startups coming on stage to present to you with a new panel of judges, so stick around, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much, everybody.